Something coming faster than any of us can imagine and will change our lives in the most dramatic ways is AI. And while AI used to sound freaky to me and just something that was gonna take over my world, it really would have revolutionized my practice had I stuck around. Many of you know, I got so burnt out from charting was the big reason I left medicine because it was frustrated with the EMRs, the clunkiness, and the amount of time it took to learn them. Not only that, but not being able to sit and connect with a patient and look them in the eye, like one-on-one -on -one while you're actually interacting with them. The whole reason we went into medicine, not to do paperwork. Yeah, so that's why May and I have started working with Lindy.ai, which is fascinating. They help you produce the most efficient notes, fully customizable, which is different than some other AI products. So you can do what you do best, which is see patients and let the artificial intelligence scribe do the dirty work for you. Yeah, not only do you get the perfect patient notes the way you want, written in any format, for whatever specialty you're in, and maybe you're in ophthalmology or vet medicine, it will also create the note, scribe and send the patient follow-up instructions, referral letters, consultation notes. It's amazing. Lindy is offering our listeners a seven-day trial to experience the difference of their AI medical scribe. Go sign up at lindy.ai slash BS free to get started. That is lindy, L-I-N-D-Y dot A-I slash BS free. Finally, a source of raw, real, and honest information on healthcare issues that matter most. Welcome to BS Free MD. The latest medical information to how to stay sane as a doctor or a patient. No subject is taboo. No BS is allowed. Now, let's welcome your hosts, Doctors May and Tim Heinmarsh. Hello, everyone, and welcome back again to BS Free MD with your hosts, Doctors May and Tim Heinmarsh. And today, we have on one of our favorite guests, who's no stranger to our show, Dr. Sabine Hazen, and she is on today to talk about a topic that has stirred some significant controversy and debate, not only across the globe here in the U.S., which is the um, impact on research and interference with publications by scientists and doctors. And she is a pioneer in uh, the medical field, the leading expert in the forefront of COVID-19 research. And um, if you haven't listened to the previous episodes with Ron, we will tag and link all of those. She, a little bit more about her, she's one of the first women accepted into the University of Florida as a clinical gastroenterology gastroenterology fellow and has contributed immensely to our understanding of the gut microbiome and its impact on health. And she's got over 20 years of um, with leading clinical trials and groundbreaking research in gastroenterology, internal medicine, and hepatology. She has tons of knowledge and insight. She has a book that's amazing called Let's Talk Shit and uh, runs a research lab I'm not going to say any more. We'll just get into it with Dr. Uh, Hazen. Welcome to the show, Sabine. I'm so used Thank to calling you. you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Always Every good to be here. Everybody loves when you come on and they learn so much. So let's just get right to it. So um, we know that your research has been blocked. Um, I think our some of our listeners know that already. Tell us a little bit about the big thing um, or what happened first before we get into the Senate hearings, but just to sort of summarize it for people that haven't heard before your research and how it got blocked in, in, um, yeah. So, so when, when COVID hit, I had a genetic sequencing lab. I had a clinical research organization that was doing clinical trials for pharma and basically figured, well, let's look at all the protocols and figure out a combination drug um, to utilize for COVID, right? Much like how we've treated other bugs in the past that are resistant to antibiotics, C. diff, you know, uh, H. pylori, it's, uh, you know, hepatitis C, it's all kind of combination drug, right? So Dr. Barodi, who uh, was my partner in this, who I wrote the book, Let's Talk Shit With, uh, <laughs> you know, 
we started like he started looking up the ivermectin route. I started looking at the hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, zinc because it was like H A Z, first three letters of my last name. So I was like oh, <laughs> serendipitous. So I called it the Haze D Pack uh, with looking at the brilliant work of Didier Raoul. Obviously, that's what inspired me. Um, and of course, you know, you've, we've seen doctors that were on the front line speaking highly on hydroxychloroquine and ZPAC. So I felt that, you know, this might be a good combination with the idea that hydroxychloroquine and ZPAC probably kills the virus and vitamin C, D and zinc probably improve the microbiome because, you know, those drugs possibly could kill the microbiome as well at the time. So I created a patent, created a protocol, submitted it to the FDA. Uh, we got accepted fairly early. We were number four clinical trial to be run and approved by the FDA, um, April 2nd, 2020. Um, and it was basically, well, you could do a, a treatment protocol and you could do a prophylaxis protocol and you could um, and start running them. And actually, you don't even need to run a clinical trial. You could just put them to market. In other words, proceed with treating patients, right? That was the FDA's first letter. The second letter, two days later, one or two days later, was, I'm sorry, Dr. Hazen, you have to do a full-on clinical trial. And that's when I, I said to myself, okay, well, what what went, why? We're in the middle of a pandemic. Why am I doing a clinical trial? Can't we just treat, stop the pandemic, and then kind of look at what, you know, work, right. you know? Because I felt like back then I was kind of innocent coming from, you know, <laughs> having done clinical trials for pharma. And I think we all were, right? We all believed in the pharma is out for us, to, is out to help us, and is out to heal the world, etc. I think that's that was how I entered anyways, because here I was doing clinical trials for the last almost three decades uh, for pharma, really seeing drugs, good drugs go to the market and helping patients. So to me, you know, that was the interest of pharma. So I really believed in that. So I thought we were all at the same level, right? Same, the race is starting and all these doctors and innovators are all figuring out which drug and let's see which one comes out with the best solution to at least turn off the pandemic, shut off the pandemic, stop the virus, etc. What I discovered uh, was it was not, a fair race in a way, because, you know, we were stopped, we were delayed, you know, there were so many factors that came on. And, and the reason now in retrospect, why we were delayed was really because of the fact that if the treatment came out and worked, then the vaccine would not come out. And I think we all know that by now. And the other, th the other factor that I, came to realize is, wait a minute, a lot of people have a lot of incentive in these stocks of Moderna and Pfizer. So if you're a regulatory agent and you're supposed to be monitoring, but you're allowed to buy stocks in pharma, that's not really, you know, unbiased, right? So to me, how do you, how do you see a drug or a vaccine properly when, um, when essentially the you have an incentive. You can make money from the stocks, right? So that's the that that was what was going on in my mind. What we discovered through the research, obviously, was, you know, well, one, we discovered the corruption of research, right? And how, you know, even if you are innovating a new drug, a cheap solution, it is going to get stopped because the big guys have a lot of money, a lot of power to push these big expensive drugs that are going to kill the little drugs that are like, you know, pennies, you know, that you cannot really, even though I patented it, it's not really enforceable in a way, right? Because mm -hmm. anybody can write the generic hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, vitamin C, D, and zinc. So, you know, the way that it's done and the way that it, it was supposed to be done in a way, if I wanted to make it a pharmaceutical product, was to keep it hidden, like proprietary, kind of what Paxlovid did, right? You don't know what's in Paxlovid, but guess what? It's it's fine because nobody can reproduce it. I'm sure you can make it or reproduce it cheaper, but while they maintain this drug proprietary and top secret, nobody can really reproduce. And in a way, I understand that because 
you invest so much money in, in the clinical trials and the clinical research, you want to see that drug maximize its potential. Okay. But what I didn't understand is COVID I thought was off limit, right? In other words, yes, you can do that for a new cancer drug. You could do that for a new, um, you know, psoriasis drug, but when the whole world is affected and you're going to vaccinate the whole entire world, we have a problem because you could annihilate the whole entire world with your solution. Right. And so that was the reason that was the, what went on. And then of course, as we showed, you know, COVID is in the stools, COVID is, um, you know, COVID is in the stools, loss of bifidobacteria was linked with severe patients with COVID versus patients with high risk exposed. Then once we showed vitamin C increases the bifidobacteria, then we showed ivermectin increases the bifidobacteria. It all started, the, the corruption, the interference started like lighting up. And it started lighting up when a hypothesis that I wrote. So remember, I do research. So I knew that ivermectin increased bifidobacteria. Within 24 hours, I want to specify that because everybody tags me and says, oh, Dr. He is in, it increases the bifidobacteria. That's why I feel better. Yes, within 24 hours when you need it, we don't have any long-term studies to see whether ivermectin increases the bifidobacteria long-term, right? What is it? What does it do to the microbiome to take ivermectin for the re- for like 10 years, for one year, for six months. We don't have any data on that. So the research needs to be done and it needs to be done ethically and righteously. So when I published that hypothesis and it was censored, I knew there was a problem. And then when I showed that the vaccines affect the bifidobacteria and kills the microbiome, kills the bifidobacteria, which is this most important, you know, microorganism that, you know, we're born with a lot in children. children. Babies are born with a lot of bifidobacteria and we die. We have zero bifidobacteria. Um, to me, that was an important microbe to preserve, right? So and especially seeing that, you know, it was present in people that are high risk exposed and never got COVID. And so when the vaccine killed this bifidobacteria within a month and then the persistence of it, even though it was four patients, Um, you know, and one went up first and then kind of dropped, it was still an alarm, right? And then here's what, why I started speaking, not because of the fact that, you know, it's a small study for patients or even the study that we did on the vaccines pre and post was a small study, but I started speaking because I said to I started seeing the vaccine injured, the people that were vaccine injured. And what I was noticing inevitably in all of them was this loss of bifidobacteria. So when you see loss of bifidobacteria in Crohn's disease, naive, loss of bifidobacteria in Lyme, loss of bifidobacteria in invasive cancer, loss of bifidobacteria post this messenger RNA vaccine, loss of bifidobacteria in people that are long haulers, people that are vaccine injured, you have to ask yourself, what is going on here that is causing this and I, si- I sounded the alarm and I started speaking on it. And of course, you've seen, I was, when my ivermectin hypothesis was posted and published, I was in jail of, you know, Twitter, which at the time was Twitter. Now X is fine. Uh, you know, I was censored on every different platform. I was censored from even advertising for my clinical trials. So bottom line is. I'm here to expose the corruption in a way. And really what I should have been exposing is the microbiome, but instead I'm showing the corruption. So one thing comes to mind, how do you know somebody is vaccine injured and it's not, you know, quote, long COVID from the infection? Because what we see a lot are these studies that say, you know, if you get the vaccine, you have less of a chance of getting long COVID, which to me, you know, smells like, you know what, because there's no really good data in the United States on who's vaccinated and who's not. It's not like the UK where they actually had, you know, vaccine, you know, digital cards or whatever. Like we have really no idea. And then we have this completely insane idea that if you've had one vaccine and you get sick and die, you're unvaccinated. If you have two vaccines and you die two days later, you're unvaccinated. 
If you have two vaccines and you die three weeks later, well, then you're vaccinated. <laughs> so like it's it's all it's all a steaming pile. So how did you differentiate that? Because clearly a lot of the stuff you see from the CDC just doesn't make any sense. And, and the CDC, and I want to remind you know everyone, the CDC is not your doctor. The CDC no. is not doing the research on the front line, okay? They're not there. They're questioning. They're looking at the data. They're looking at the research, but they're not your doctor, right? I, you know, medicine and research happens on the front line. It's touching these patients. It's taking a history. It's evaluating. It's analyzing. The, for me, anyways, it's analyzing their stools, right? And taking the history. I cannot tell you how many patients come to me and are vaccinated four or five times and basically say to me, I'm a long hauler. And then I take the history and I go, well, let, let, let's look at your history, okay? So when did you get, did you get COVID in the 20s, in 2020? No. When did you get vaccinated? 2021. And you got how many shots? One, two, three. So then you can kind of see the progression, right? of the bifidobacteria, which is what I've been saying all along of the bifidobacteria getting killed before and after vaccination. You could see the, the bifidobacteria is dropping, right? In your mind, you can kind of go, okay. And you could follow these folks and you'll kind of see the bifidobacteria drops. Now their bifidobacteria is down. Their bacteroides, which is the bad microbe is up. Now they've got leaky gut, right? So mm -hmm. leaky gut, when you look at it, it's really an imbalance of the good and the bad guys. And it's not necessarily the bacteroides. It could be the firmicutes and, and the proteobacteria. It's all about the balance, right? So when you have this imbalance where your bifidobacteria is zero down, okay, viruses, you're susceptible to viruses. Remember, we are exposed to viruses all day long. We go to the, to the bus, we go to the metro, we go, we touch a doorknob that somebody coughed on and, and touched it. We're not getting those. There's no way to live in this bubble of an environment. It doesn't happen. And then what do you do? You're sterilizing your hands with alcohol. You're spraying your mouth and your nose with all these you know, antiseptic stuff, right? You're so wearing a mask on your face. You're wearing a mask, which basically accumulates <laughs> more microbes. Exactly. But also you're doing antiseptic stuff, right? You're sterilizing the back of your mouth. That's got a lot of blood vessels. You're putting stuff in your nose. That's got a lot of blood vessels. What is that doing once it goes into the blood vessel to the bowels and then starts killing a little bit by little bit your good microbes, right? So what we're going to come to show is that when your bifidobacteria is zero, you are now susceptible to viruses. So if you listen to these folks that say long hauler, they will tell you, doctor, I got vaccinated month one, then I got the second shot, then I got the third shot, then I got COVID, right? These brilliant, young, healthy kids that should have never, that should have been in my, should have been stool donors, frankly, <clears throat> because they had so much bifidobacteria. And then you start testing their stools, right? Because you say, okay, well, let me see if they had, if COVID is still in the stools, right? So remember, we do next generation sequencing, which is basically whole genome sequencing of COVID, which is extremely expensive, extremely tedious. We published on it. Um, and essentially, that's what we're doing to look for COVID. Now, we look at these folks that come in as long haulers or vaccine or vaccine injured, but they call themselves long haulers. And we don't see anything of, we don't see any virus left in. Now, sometimes these long haulers have COVID, whole genome sequencing still in there. So you got to kill it, then you treat it, and basically they feel better, okay? So that's why you've got these folks that are basically, well, I took hydroxychloroquine when I was long hauler and I felt better. Yeah, but the problem is then you're killing your microbiome. And if mm. you've got loss of bifidobacteria, if you've got loss of bifidobacteria to begin with, it doesn't matter that you're killing your bifidobacteria with the medications, right? But if you don't have loss of bifidobacteria, you're killing your bifidobacteria. And that's also hard to recuperate, you know, kind of like what the vaccine does. So let's say that patient comes in three shots, gets COVID, now his bifidobacteria is zero. He's got COVID. He takes treatment, right? Whatever the drug is of choice, right? 
Paxlovid, Molnupiravir, Iver, well, not Ivermectin, but like Hydroxy, Azithromycin, whatever, Amoxicillin, whatever the drug of choice is, that keeps killing your microbiome. So you're trying to recuperate the, that bifidobacteria, but you're back down again. So now you've like totally fried your colon and you have zero seeds of bifidobacteria in your gut. So can you really say that these long haulers are, you know, from COVID? Or can you say maybe it's from the vaccine killing the BIF or maybe it's from the treatment killing the BIF, right? You so can, can, so, so can I, you differentiate <clears throat> with your whole genome test? Can you differentiate between spike protein from the vaccine and whole virus? Because if you can, then you know if they have zero whole. So we, we have a formula. We're looking at it. Uh, we're testing a lot of patients. Nothing that I can really discuss right now. But that's the goal, right? The goal is to say who is vaccine injured and who is long hauler from COVID so we can fine tune better and, and, and treat better, right? Because... If you're treating spike protein that's still remaining in your system from the vaccine, that's a different treatment than if you're treating the spike protein that's remaining from COVID, okay? And I say that because they're different, right? The virus has the whole, it's a, you know, the spike protein is a piece of the virus of COVID. The vaccine is a different, is a different entity in itself in that it's a spike protein. But as we saw from Kevin McKernan's studies and Philip Buckholtz, there are contaminations, you know, in the plasmid that um, you can't say those are innocent, right? So then you wonder, well, is the plasmid, is the nanoparticle itself a damaging to the microbiome on top of that? You know, so those are the, that's the research. That's what we want to do. <clears throat> no, no, because that, I, I, <clears throat> a whole bunch of things come blasting out of my oversized So head. I have to ask, we were asked, though I know this question is going to get asked, people that do have the ability to get ivermectin and use it occasionally, because I know people are still doing it prophylactically, taking doses, does that kill the, the, um, the bifido too? No, it grows it. It grows it within 24 I hours. I wanted her to say. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you were listening, you would know. <laughs> no, 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 but she's right. Yeah. That's a very good uh, perception. It grows it within 24 hours. It does not necessarily grow it past the 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And I know the answer to that, but I can't say it until I publish it, unfortunately. Uh, but I would say, you know, if you're that patient that has been prophylaxing on ivermectin, those are the people I want to test their microbiome. So if they want to contact Progena Biome, we would love to have more data on that because I want to see the long-term effect of taking prophylaxis. You know, and I've told Pierre Corey and I've told Peter McCullough and I've told all those guys, if you're giving ivermectin, you know, consider maybe testing long-term so we could see whether these folks have a high bifidobacteria or whether they have a low bifidobacteria. Granted, you know, the testing is expensive, but there are some people that would want to know and would test. And, you know, we do have a foundation and we do raise money. We're trying to raise money constantly, the Microbiome Research Foundation. So we do put people that cannot afford testing on a list so we can gather that information. And that's, look, I have a, I have a American College of Gastros coming up in October and the deadline is June. So I have to like figure out what am I going to present at ACG uh, that's kind of, you know, out there. Um, so I'd love to see what the effect of ivermectin long-term is. Well, but I, I just look at it, you know, it's, it's my, I don't know, maybe I was born a lawyer in a doctor's body. Um, but I, I see if you have a, if you have a differentiator, even if it's a $3,000 test, but it, it differentiates between, you know, somebody with the long haul syndrome and it differenti differentiates between spike protein and native virus, and you can go, no, they're, they got a, you know, they had a vaccine six weeks ago and they're still cranking out spike yes. protein and pooping it out and they feel awful. And here's the timeline of when they got a shot and now here's how they feel, et cetera, et cetera. That is worth hundreds of billions of dollars of lawsuits. Yes. And, and by the way, 
I know, but I just can't say it right now. No, I, you know I, what I've yeah. done? I, I did, I did that with hydroxychloroquine. I put it out there. I did that with ivermectin. I put it out there. I did that with, you know, bifidobacteria and it just gets even more and more, you know, um, censored. It, it stops me. So we really, this technology, this data needs to be, you know, seen needs to be done right. It needs to have people that are righteous behind it. And uh, we need to, it needs to be a way to bring in people to see the truth, right? I think ultimately, if we just say it, it's going to be ridiculed somewhere and then it's never going to see the light. Right. It's better to just treat and know and treat the patients. And then eventually that person that's influent, that has some influence in the <laughs> politics will change the way and the direction, you know, I, it, it's the sadness is that we cannot practice medicine the same way that we did practice medicine. You know, that's just the sad. We can't innovate the way that we were innovating because here's what happened. Here's what happens. We innovate as doctors. We write the data, right? In these journals, some businessman looks at the data, figures out, Hey, there's a business out of it. Let me snatch that. Let me ridicule the doctor and let me make this a business, right? And then it never advances because it gets put on some shelf somewhere right. where it doesn't become a treatment. And I've seen that with too many of my colleagues. We have, you know, great drugs that were doing great things and never made it to market. Why? Because they're stopped. There's, there's you know, if one good drug comes to market, it kills another one. And if the other one has too much money and too much power, they're not going to let it. They're just going to put it on a shelf somewhere. We don't want drugs. We don't want technology to just put be put on a shelf. We want to treat the patients and we need to start, you know, bringing ourselves together to say, okay, how do we treat the patients without this corruption that's in the back? So but well, you're absolutely right. Uh, listen, uh, half the stuff I know in my brain is a billion dollar business for anything. You know, imagine a signature microbiome for Parkinson's. Imagine a treatment for Parkinson's. Imagine a signature microbiome for Alzheimer's. Imagine a signature microbiome for hair growth. Imagine a signature microbiome for obesity. I mean, there's so many ways because essentially we're going to come to find out even cholesterol is a microbe you know, is a group of microbes. So what, so you're going to have to fight the cholesterol industry uh -huh. in order to push that microbiome solution to fix cholesterol. But here's the problem. The cholesterol industry has so much power, so much money, so much movement, power in the lobbyist in Washington that it's not letting innovations go out. And because, when that happens, we lose. We all lose. Yeah. Right. Because it pays to have people sick and on their drugs. And, you know, and I don't, I don't want to be that conspiracy theories person. It's, I really think it's just a question of money. Right. I think it's a question of my company needs to survive. And therefore I'm going to choke the little guys that are coming out with this new innovation. I really think that's what it is. So what we saw with COVID and ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine and z and all that was really a healthcare revolution. And I think that's what it needs to be. It needs to be a healthcare revolution. I, I And it's kind of funny because when I started Progena Biome, it was the logo was the quest for a healthcare revolution. I didn't know that that's really <laughs> what was needed. I just like, I said, well, you know, this, we need a new path. We're not curing anything. We don't have any cures for anything. Okay. Think about, I mean, maybe two things, H. pylori and hepatitis C, right? What else have we cured? Have we cured diabetes? Have we cured, you know, have we cured cancer? Have we cured Parkinson's? Have we cured Alzheimer's, autism? No, we've not cured anything. So, you know, and, and it was kind of funny because about 10, 15 years ago, my mom said that to me. She's like, so people with diabetes, you don't have a treatment for them. I go, no, you just put them on medications for the rest of their lives. She goes, there's no cure. 
I go, no. She goes, so why do people come to you? And, and I, you know, because my mom's an accountant, right? <laughs> so, and I have to think, you know what, mom? You're right. We should be aiming for cures. Because think about it. You guys are healthy. You're traveling the country, you know, et cetera. You've traveled the country. You don't want to be sick. You don't want to be reminded you're sick. You don't want to be taking a pill every month or seeing the doctor. You want to be like fixed, going back to work and forgetting that you're a patient. That's what half the world wants. But instead, we keep them in this, you know, comp in this, you know, mode of sickness because sickness pays. And so it's not about, you know, conspiracy. It's about money and money's running, you know, running healthcare and, and guiding healthcare. Well, yeah. And you just can't help but think that with all of the immune modulating we've done over the last 50 years yeah. plus antibiotics plus ultra processed food plus demonizing animal fat and all of these other things that we know can be really healthy and then we wonder why we've shifted from acute illness you know we don't have measles outbreaks you know they get 10 cases in florida right. and everyone wants to nail you know joe latipo to the cross because right. there's 10 or, cases or, or. and you know it's 10 cases for god's sake yes and so we've traded, you know, acute illness for chronic illness. Yes. And honestly, w would you rather have uh, your kid have chicken pox or whatever and be done with it with a very low risk of mortality, almost zero, and a very, very low, low risk of any kind of long-term morbidity? Or would you rather have them like neurodegenerative or with Crohn's disease in 20 years or God right. knows what other immune, these are all immune Someone modulated us diseases. That question, remember on our social post, they said, I'd rather have a potentially damaged child that might be autistic from a vaccine than a dead child from measles. And I was like, I mean, wow, wow. Your, and, the and odds measles, are not in your favor with yeah. what you're choosing. Here. No, they, like they're wildly out of your Why favor. The, games, the odds yes. are not in your favor. Uh, no, I'm like, and, and so, you know, and, and we're not saying we're not saying any vaccine causes. But here's the anything. thing, right? And here's a here's a philosophical question or here's a question, right? Are we vaccinating the kids to protect the vulnerable? Because really, that's what it's all about. We are taking this little newborn, which is going to do fine with measles, mom's rubella. That's what we did with COVID, right? We vaccinated these kids to protect grandma, right? Mm -hmm. But what if the solution to protecting grandma was building up grandma's microbiome instead of vaccinating young kids? What if the solution was the microbiome of the newborn for grandma, you know what I mean? Right. So yes. We've got it all backwards. Yeah. So why are we why are we stopping progress? Why are we still practicing barbaric? And I'm going to say barbaric because we now have the technology. Okay. It's not like we don't have the technology anymore to know what these vaccines are doing to the microbiome. We should be testing every single vaccines before and after vaccination to see what kid is bouncing back up and is doing fine and what kid is not so we can intercept those kids early, treat them and avoid the problem down the road. So there's no excuse because we have the technology. We can see these microbes, you know, with a genetic sequence now. So. Hey, I have a question. Then, back then, what I'm saying is like, in the olden days, you didn't know you had an excuse. You were like, oh, well, you know, we're going to die of the bubonic plague. You know, I was looking at, and I'm just going to say this quickly. George Washington had a virus and was, they, they did phlebotomy on him, removed his blood for a virus. Okay. He had a cold and he died really from the complication of removing so much blood because they made him anemic, right? Imagine if we were still practicing medicine like this. When you had a fever, we're going to remove, you know, liters of blood from you. Well, no, but but we're doing stuff like that right now. There's yes. no question. Yes, I mean, we're like, getting yes. 72 vaccines to kids and we're thinking like, oh, it's fine. And I mean, one in 22 kids is autistic in California. 
uh, you know, it was 144, you know, it was in 1970, it was in 1980, it was one in 2000, you know, where have we gone? And everybody says to me, well, we have better technology now to pick up these kids. No, these kids were speaking when I was a kid. I never saw a kid with autism that was nonverbal. Mm -hmm. Now I have thousands on a wait list for fecal transplant that are nonverbal. I mean, and that's just me, Dr. Adams uh, in Arizona, thousands, you know, these nonverbal kids, where did they come from? You know, they didn't just, you know, and, and this is difficult for parents that are monitoring that. No, hey, I, I want to go, go, uh, go ahead, I, I have this question in my head, because I know a lot of people were when, are wondering, we were talking about that you could test for the spike protein from the vaccine and differentiate that when people get it from the COVID infection. Have you been testing anyone and found that they weren't vaccinated, but still had spike protein from the vaccine in their body? Because a lot of people are talking about their kids now getting weird. Yeah, from the shedding, getting weird symptoms from being around friends. Yeah, I can't discuss it yet because I haven't really analyzed it. We're in the process of collecting and, and looking and still looking. So I can't really say it until, and here's how it works in my life. But, you, but you'd have the ability oh, to we have the ability. detect it if yes, it yes, was, yes. A, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, we have the ability. We're looking at it. We're taking the histories. We're taking, mm-hmm. analyzing the stools. We're, you know, utilizing different, you, you know, reagents and different kits to kind of get to that answer. Um, that's ultimately the goal, right? But here's how it works in my lab, Okay. I'm like you guys on the front line as physicians, and I have these questions, right? Is this long hauler? Is this COVID? Is this um, vaccine injuries? How do I, as a physician, you know, when you're a physician, you have to kind of like look for things to help you, right? So I basically collect the data, collect the history, collect the stools. And then I basically say, okay, let me send it to the lab. My lab doesn't know what these people are. They're just numbers. They're not. And then from there, I give it to a scientist because I want to stay completely unbiased. You know what I mean? I'm the physician. I collect the the data. I collect the stools. I give it to the lab. The lab then gives it to my scientist. Then we have another scientist that takes it. So that scientist in my lab basically collects all the numbers, right? So she'll see the phytobacteria is this. We have this spike here. We've got this here. She'll see it all, okay? Then from there, it gets sent to another scientist to basically do the statistical analysis, okay? So it's a long process. And then they give me the results. With ivermectin, when I was treating, I was giving patients before and after. And and then other doctors were giving before, you know, ivermectin. And I would say, hey, guys, can you send me patients that you're going to treat? Let me get a baseline and let me get... 24 hours after the ivermectin, let me test their stools. That's why I say it's only 24 hours that it increases because that's all I tested. Now, my protocol was very strict. It was give a, get me a stool sample at baseline, get me a stool sample 24 hours after the ivermectin. And sure enough, that's I sent my data to, again to the lab. Lab processes it. They look for bifidobacteria, the relative abundance and everything, sends it to the scientist who puts it all in a nice graph and sends it to a statistician that's not even in our office. And basically he's looking at it and then he sends me a graph and he says, Sabine, ivermectin increases bifidobacteria and the p-value is 0.00001. That's how it works in my lab because I don't want to be the person that's like, I have a vision, I have a hypothesis and I'm biased by my hypothesis. So it's really them telling me. And then afterwards as a team, we write the paper. But that's how it's going to be even for the spike. You're going to see data from me, uh, you know, provided I'm still standing uh, and I haven't killed my biff to zero from all the stress. Um, you know, essentially, you're going to see the data and we're going to show it. And whether we, whether we see a difference, whether we don't see a difference, we're still going to publish it because all research needs to be published. That's it. Whether the results are you know, what I expected or the results are not what I expected, I'm still going to publish it. So so tell us a little bit about um, how Senator Johnson got a hold of you and had you and many others speak out about the censorship and what's been happening. So Senator 
Peter Johnson is a remarkable man. He actually reached out to me at the beginning when he started his Senate hearings. And I was, and I, and he found me because I was part of a group of doctors with, you know, trying to get to join forces to see the data. We were sharing articles, we were sharing data. And he was part of that group kind of, you know, in there to see what we were seeing. Um, and he called me and because I had the protocol. Remember, I was number four on clinicaltrials.gov when COVID hit. So I had the hydroxy Z pack, vitamin C, D, and zinc. So he called me and he said, Dr. Hazan, um, I want to know the truth about hydroxychloroquine and Z pack. And I said, Senator, I don't know the truth. I'm doing the research, but I'll tell you what I see. Okay. <laughs> and, and then he asked me to be part of that first, you know, Senator Senate meeting. And um, I couldn't because I didn't want to be out there. I didn't want to be speaking on a drug. I didn't want to bias. I didn't want to get myself into problems with the regulatory board. Why is Dr. Hazen promoting her trial when she's doing the research, etc.? cetera? When, um, and, and every time he was doing one of those hearings, he kept asking me at some point, and I forget when it was, I think it was in 2022, he, uh, and by the way, he would refer, you know, like if there was a patient with like a vaccine injury, he would, I saw the first cases, the microbiome of the first cases of, of, uh, vaccine injury, you know, Dr. Denise Hertz, who's a friend of mine, who's a colleague, you know, was a gastroenterologist at Cedars and she's very vocal on the fact that she was vaccine injured. Uh, she was um, an amazing, she's an amazing gastroenterologist. Unfortunately, after vaccination, could not practice anymore and basically had a slew of problems, you know, from pods to inability to just, you know, hold the scope properly, etc. So she stopped practicing, um, was completely debilitated. I saw her microbiome. She had zero bifidobacteria. Uh, and then I saw another kid that basically her microbiome was the same picture as Dr. Hertz. And then you know, little by little, Denise and I started doing, you know, um, videos, etc. And then, you know, people got to know that I was doing studies on vaccine injured. Um, not that I was wanted to be doing that, but I was seeing the before and after of the vaccine. So I knew it was killing the bifidobacteria. And at the same time, I said, well, what is what are the vaccine injured looking like? Right. And in 2022, he came to my lab. He was in L.A. for something. And he drove, you know, I'm about two hours from LA and he drove to Ventura and you guys have been to my lab as well yes. to make sure I'm not like you know, full of it. And I actually, you know, not an Elizabeth Theranos, you know, from Theranos. <laughs> but anyway, so he did due diligence and he came to see my machines and all my bells and whistle in the lab. And he met my scientist and he met my lab director and my project and he saw how it was all happening, you know, and when people come in my lab, it's pretty impressive because it mm -hmm. is really the, it is the top of the line equipment. It is, you know, all the bells and whistles. I mean, like if I tell you, you know, as a woman, money has no value for me anymore because I spent so much on analyzing poop <laughs> that I, you know, when I look at, you know, I'm looking at poop of a coyote and I'm like, I wonder what's in that microbiome. And it's costing me like three grand to analyze this poop of the coyote. You know, there's something wrong with me. But this is Quest. This is what we do as scientists, right? So he came, he, I, he saw me, um, you know, so he saw my lab. And so that I was very impressed with this man. I was also very impressed with him at the beginning because I'm not a fan of politicians either side. I'm not a fan. I always find that politicians come in strong. They want to save the world and help out. And then they go up there and then they get tempted and they deviate from what they were supposed to be doing. Right. God gives you a stage or a path. You need to continue this path. So I'm not really a fan of politicians in general. And so the one thing that impressed me with him is he said, Dr. Hazen, you don't understand. I'm willing to die to see the truth. And, and that's how I felt, right? At the time, <laughs> wow. I was the same. And I was like, wow, okay, well, I, that's the kindred spirit there. So, and, and believe me, at the beginning, it was scary, right? 
it was scary to like face this virus. It was scary to say now in, in hindsight, we could say, oh, you know, we were right and this and that. But at the beginning, when this was happening, we weren't so sure. I mean, you got to stay humble. And, and I had doubts all the time. You know, am I doing the right thing? Why hydroxy? What? And actually, let me tell you, I was humbled a bunch of times through my research, you know, because hydroxy, I thought was like this amazing drug, right? And then when I saw it killed the, you know, the bifidobacteria as well, I was like, mm, I'm kind of disenchanted with it. You know, I should only give it to my old people, right? And that's when I, you know, think about it. This was my patent. I spent like, you know, thousands of dollars on patenting this protocol. And then I never brought it to market because I felt this is not a solution for all. This is a solution for the person that has zero bifidobacteria. So my whole path that was heading into a pharmaceutical product changed to where now it's, I got to focus on the BIF. I got to focus on saving the BIF. And so that's where humility comes in, in a pandemic where you learn on the force, you learn in the task, you learn doing things, you learn being the guinea pig in the front line. And it was scary times, you know? So for him to say, I'm willing to die for, for the truth and, and him trusting me, um, and trusting my research because really, you know, it comes down to trust, right? I mean, it's like you guys, you know, you came down to my lab and, and you trusted me, right? Because at the end of the day, that's what medicine is about, right? It's about mm -hmm. who do you trust? Who yes. are you going to trust with your life? Are you going to trust the guy that's sitting on a high horse selling you a drug for like $3,000 a pop that supposedly cares about you? Or are you going to trust the girl that's doing the research and really is one of your colleagues and is really trying to see the data herself with her own eyes because we need to see the data the way it is, you know? And, and you know, if you interfere with research, you it affects everyone. And imagine if I had pushed, you know, that my patent, for example, um, you know, on kids, I, I would have killed their microbiome, you know, and then I wouldn't have slept at night, you know? So I think we need to do due diligence and we need to do the proper research. And so he was impressive. So from that path of knowing him and, and collaborating with him, um, not as a Republican, not as a, you know, as a, as a politician, but really um, as a human being and as a man, I got to respect him. And so when he asked me, you know, he was doing this panel and he said, do you want to come and speak on the microbiome? And I said, yeah, I'll talk about the interference of research. Because really that's the one thing I'm sure of mm -hmm. and that I've experienced was the interference of research, was the, the fact that I was censored, that the fact that my papers, you know, that paper that I yes. won the research award for uh, by the American College of Gastro, be showing the bifidobacteria before and after it still not published, still not published. And the reviewers, I picked this journal and the journal took a year and a half to peer review it. Have you ever heard of a peer review a year and a half? And then here's the comment from the reviewer. This article belongs in a Facebook to in a Facebook, uh, blog. A Facebook blog. What kind of review is that? A wow. year and a half of asking us questions back and forth. Like, were these patients this? Or can you explain why you thought of this in the protocol? Can you explain this? A year and a half. And then they're like, oh, we have just a few corrections. It's going to go to press. And a few corrections to make. And then we'll get back to you. And after a year and a half, the review says it should belong in a Facebook blog unprofessional, bot, corrupt. That's all I have to say. So how, how, how do we, how do we fight these people? Because, you know, I can't, I can post all day on X and you know, that you might. Know how you fight, you fight by stopping to publish. So guess what? You want to know about how the vaccine, how to differentiate the vaccine versus the spike protein. Well, let me publish. You want to know how I fixed my Alzheimer's patient and he went from a mini mental status of 21 
to 29 and you want to see what I'm doing and what microbes are involved, well, let me publish. All publications need to be out there. It's up to scientists. It's up to doctors to criticize. What do we do in Gut Club? You know, these peer review, you know, when you were in residency, right. what did we do? We took a journal and we dissected it. Mm -hmm. You know, I looked at a journal recently that was on, they looked at breastfed babies versus formula fed versus control, right? I dissected the whole journal. They must have spent about a million dollars on that study. And I said, this study is flawed, has no meaning, it's garbage, okay? So to me, I, I don't need to look at this data. I can read this data. I can dissect it. I could say, I could, I looked at the methods and I said, these are improper methods. This is not what I would have done. And this needs to be completely redone and re looked at to see the truth. But now if the paper is trying to sell, and unfortunately that's what's happening now. A lot of these papers are trying to sell a product, right? So they're going to write it in such a way that it sells a product and they're going to pay to put it in a fancy journal. So for our listeners that don't know who's, who, you know, is every journal different? Who's reviewing and making decisions on what gets published? Well, a lot of times the reviewers are unbiased and are, you know, academics or res or professors in the college and they're <laughs> usually pretty good. Um, and they give their opinion and then it comes back to the doctor and then they rewrite the data. Um, too often, some peer reviewers can infiltrate that are working for pharma. In other words, hi, I'm working for pharma, but I'm going to do on the side job, I'm going to be a peer reviewer. And so they're completely biased when they see a protocol that could, you know, impact their livelihood. Um, and then you have to remember these journals are paid by pharmaceutical companies, you know, these high impact. When you look at New England Journal of Medicine, who pays New England Journal of Medicine, who pays, you know, Nature's, who pays Lancet, you know, they're high impact because they got money to be put to put themselves on a stage. You well, know, then that should just negate them right there. The fact that they're bought if, out if, if yeah but i mean how you know then you look at how does a journal survive a journal survive from the marketing and the publicity right when you submit do you know who's reviewing your uh, study sometimes you do sometimes you don't yeah so are you ever tempted to put a little bag of leftover microbiome on there i'm just <laughs> no 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 Ring, ring the doorbell no i yeah, mean but, okay. but, there, but there's another thing that i never understood until no. until covid which was when the peer reviewers get the data, they get the data that the, the, like assuming it's a pharma trial, which most of them are, right? So assuming it's a pharma trial, so drug company X produces the data, they, 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 you know, they have it collated and figured out by an, another company, you know, like one of Sasha Latipova's companies or whatever that she used to run. They take that information, they send it out to the reviewers, the reviewers review it, and they don't get the raw data, they get the collate, they don't get the 70,000 pages of actual raw data. Correct. So, so you can cook the books like yes. crazy in an RCT and have it peer reviewed and have the P value good and have everything all buttoned up, but it's been corrupted to beat hell yes. before it left the lab. Yes. And by the way, let me tell you, you can do the clinical trial because I've been doing clinical trials for too long. You can do the clinical trials in your site and see all these side effects of the drug and you can write it in there. And some companies can delete blank the, the, the side effect at the website on the portal that's in the Philippines, right? Remember, all clinical trials now, the majority are outsourced, okay? So they are all electronic capture. So the data goes up to the cloud and then it goes to the Philippines to be reviewed. Anybody could just push a button and delete something. Anybody can make the data, you know, it's very tough for FDA agents. And I'm going to say this, it's very tough for FDA agents to pick up on cheating in a clinical trial. Hmm. It's very tough. So, and, and cheating does happen. Okay. I've seen it. A lot of my, you know, colleagues have seen it 
where, you know, a side effect was not reported properly. Um, so cheating does happen. It's very tough to pick up. Okay. Um, also the way you present the data is also in a way cheating because, you know, you're kind of like presenting the data, you know, in a way that's, you're not going to show the success. You're going to show the lack of failures, right? You're going to show, you know, well, you know, it decreases reoccurrences by 65%, but you're not going to show, well, it only worked in 20%, right? Mm -hmm. So you're going to show the bigger number that's like it decreases reoccurrences by 65%, like big number, but you're not going to see, but it improved the patient. It only improved 20% of the patients, right? So this is how they present, how I can present. Right. If I do a, if I, now here's the thing, cause I, again, I've done clinical trials for too long to know if, um, you know, what happens to the drugs is when they get to the market, the doctors know. So exactly. You can, you can paint shit any way you want. Okay. And you could sell it in a beautiful, fancy journal. And you could sell it in a beautiful, fancy meeting with like all sorts of bells and whistles and, you know, have a, a mascot for your drug and everything. But then ultimately, the doctors are going to use the drug. And ultimately, it's not going to work so great. Okay. Well, and they always work worse by definition. Yeah. And then you're going to have conversations. Yes. Think right. about drugs like Zelnor. Right. Think about drugs that were for weight for obesity. Fen right? Fen. Yeah, Fen, Fen, Fen Fen, right? Well we saw all that. Oh, Ozempic is gonna be on the chopping block here. Oh, soon. It's gonna oh be my gosh. gosh. Yes. It's gonna be on the chopping. So well, look at fluoroquinolones for God's sake. We handed that we handed those things out for every UTI known to man for it it took and I tell patients this. I said, you know, everyone's freaked out about fluoroquinolones. When Cipro came out, it it must have taken a billion or more prescriptions before we even had a hint about tendon injury, mm -hmm. a hint. Okay. A billion prescriptions and you know, Lysinopril, it only has half of a percent of people get cough. No, about 20% right. get right. cough. I mean, well, exactly. Exactly. And, but know, then you know, right. You're an informed consumer, right? Now, you know, and the doctors know, so you cannot hide that anymore. And that's when they come up with the real data, right? So I always say, if a drug is going to make it, it's going to make it, you know, what the number one, it, you know, people say, well, you know, these anti-vaxxers, they're influencing. We didn't need to, we barely had a voice. I mean, like 150,000 followers on X is not a voice. Okay. I mean, <laughs> if I had like 10 million, 74 million. Yeah. Maybe I could influence the world. But the reality is that's not a voice, okay? I mean, it's like, great, a lot of people are following me, but that's not a voice, okay? But you're doing it to get rich, obviously, oh, because clearly, you get, clearly, you get paid know. hundreds of millions of dollars a year to be an anti-vaxxer, obviously. <laughs> yes, I heard that. So anyways, but you know what? It wasn't us saying anything, okay? It was doctors noticing. It wasn't working, okay? When you got COVID after the shot, the doctor realized, wait a minute, this thing is supposed to protect me from not catching COVID. Why am I having COVID? And here's the other thing. When doctors are repeatedly getting sick, you know, like I had, and I go to these conferences all the time. I call them the convert doctors, you know, doctors that convert from, you know, <laughs> having, uh, believing in the whole vaccine thing. And then they're like converting and they're like, wait a minute, why am I? Why do I continue getting sick? Right? So you see it because the doctor gets sick that you, you know, doctors were first on the front line to risk their lives for COVID you guys, mm -hmm. myself, without a mask, we didn't even have masks at the beginning. And then you, you were like, well, you know what? I didn't wear a mask and I'm still fine. I'm going to continue doing what I'm doing. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you kept going. Right. And then all of a sudden, they use the doctors as the guinea pigs. Oh, the doctors have to vaccinate first. Okay, let's get all the doctors vaccinated. So they were the first ones on the front line that got vaccinated. Now, some of them never got COVID. They're great, super microbiome, resilient, um, amen. But a lot of them that were perfectly fine, perfectly healthy, 
you know, I, I remember go, I go to all these conferences where I give lectures and doctors come to me. They're like all the time. They're like, you know, your bifidobacteria theory, you know, makes sense because I was always healthy. And now I'm getting colds every time, like every month I'm getting a cold. So, you know, doctors start seeing it. Right. And then you have doctors like Dr. Hertz, who basically, you know, got incapacitated, right. Where she can't work. She tells her neurologist who calls me, who tells his other neurologist. And then amongst themselves, they start talking and they start saying, Hey, you know what? I've been noticing a lot of CMV encephalitis. Have you? Mm -hmm. I've been noticing a lot of herpes encephalitis. Have you? And then they put two, two and two together. So what you're seeing on the, the reason that 5% of people are getting reboosted is not done because of us anti-vaxxers. Me, I mean, I used to bring vaccines to the market. I mean, I still do clinical trials for vaccines. You know what I mean? I'm not, you know, but the real vaccines, not a messenger RNA pipeline. Right. I, I want to see the data. You know, obviously, if I'm going to be that the grandmother that's going to vaccinate my kid, I want to see that this vaccine, I want to be on the front line evaluating the vaccine and making sure because I know me. If a, if a drug is good, it's going to market. If a drug is bad, it's not going to market. I'm sorry. I'm going to do, I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to say, I'm going to call the FDA. I'm going to say, look, this kid died two days later. Serious adverse event. I'm going to report it. That's what we do. That's what clinical research doctors do. They report serious adverse events. I've all, I'm a stickler and, and the FDA knows this about me. And my coordinators knows, know this about me. I'm a stickler for serious adverse event. I do not sign the case books, you know, like pharmaceutical companies, they, they rush you. They're like, we need the case books being signed on Friday. I'm like, nope. I need to take my time and make sure it's in the electronic data capture. And you won't believe how many times serious adverse events were in my chart reported to the FDA, to the IRB, and were not in the EDC right before I signed it. So guess who's liable at that point? If God right. forbid something happens, Sabine Hazen, because I did not, I did not pick up that the serious adverse event was in the EDC. So in other words, you know, the, the pharmaceutical company can come back and say, well, Dr. Hazen, you didn't put it in the EDC, right. you know? I, th I think there's something mm -hmm. else that's really important for people to understand because I never, again, COVID ripped a lot of, a lot of band-aids off of, you know, what I believed as well. But this whole concept of these studies are not done they don't go to pencil, you know, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and go to a Steelers game and recruit 50,000 people for a study. That's not how it works. They're done all over the world by a whole bunch of different little micro companies that then coalesce the data. Yeah. So, you know, the Pfizer vaccine data, most of it came out of Venezuela and you sit there and like literally the irony, it should have been called the irony vaccine because yeah. a bunch of a bunch of German scientists actually went to Venezuela to do a test on a novel drug. Like when have Germans misbehaved in Venezuela before? <laughs> and, yeah. and, you know, and, and then, but and then point. Israel, the only drug, the only vaccine they bought was Pfizer. And I'm like, wow, you guys are very forgiving. You know, you can't make this up. It's like you can't it, make this shit up. I'm sorry. It, it literally right. is like watching idiocracy. It's so crazy. But who was behind that? Who pushed that? Who was who was behind orchestrated all this? Who's who hired those German scientists? Who hired the Venezuelan companies? You know what I mean? This this is there's a little bit of nefariousness going on there. OK, and it needs to be investigated. And unfortunately, you know, People tend to support and, and follow money. And sometimes you got to kind of look at the person with the money and say, what are they doing exactly? And is right. this for the benefit of humanity or the detriment? But again, to bring back to the, you know, to these drugs, you can cheat only for so long. Eventually the doctors find out you can write your paper as beautiful yeah. as it is. Eventually the doctors find out, you know, when the data comes out, it comes out in the front line first. I remember doing a clinical trial, which will remain nameless. And the data was not that great for the trial. Okay. 
And then the drug came, but the drug made it to market. Okay. It was a $10,000 prescription for, uh, for C. diff. And I basically, you know, gave it to my first two patients. I didn't want to do fecal transplant too much, you know, playing with poop and all that. I said, you know what, I'm just going to give this drug. The insurance is paying for it. Let me bring them to my office. Two out of two, the drug didn't work. I spent $10,000, two out of two. Now I'm left with a patient that's having severe diarrhea from a C. diff dying. Now I have to sit down and do fecal transplant and I have to pick my donor, right? So for me, I don't need to do like a hundred. Like if it doesn't work, why am I spending $10,000 when what I know what I'm doing is working, right? So doctors were treating COVID, right? And they knew what was working because they were not losing patients, right? So they know what's working. Why would they write an expensive drug when they know what they're doing is working? But that's clinical. And then fast forward to even patients getting the multiple vaccines and then boosters. And then they notice, well, how come I'm still getting sick? Yes. How come I'm sicker than the people that aren't getting them? Hmm. No, and and, and yeah. here's the bigger problem, okay? And here's the thing. Everybody knows someone who has a complication. Yes. You yeah. can't hide it anymore. People come to me and they're like, you know, this kid died in soccer practice. This, you know, this person just got cancer and died within a month. This person, so obviously we can't make the correlations, right? But the fact that people are talking about it that's bad publicity for the drug, period. Right. I didn't have to say anything. The people are noticing, you know? I'm just connecting the dots. I'm saying, could it be that we're killing the bifidobacteria? Could it be that loss of bifidobacteria is linked to invasive cancer? Could it? I'm asking a question. If we can't ask a question in science, it's not science. If we no, can't and, make and, a hypothesis, and that's exactly science. right. Like, if you can't ask a question, it's not science. The other thing is, you're not a righteous investigator unless you reserve the right to be wrong. 100%. And I've said, yes. you know, if you if you look at the history just of our dopey podcast, we have changed our views on lots of things over yes. the last three years because that's what it means to, yeah. to actually ask questions. Is yes. you're gonna go, you know what? Holy crap, I was really wrong about that thing, and I'm gonna change my mind. And yes. you know, next year it might be different. It doesn't mean I'm wishy washy. It means I'm honest. And- it means that you're seeing something new. You have a new technology that's allowing you to see something new. You cannot, you have to go with that direction, right? So how many times in my practice have I tried one thing and it didn't work and I was so convinced it was going to work. And then I try another thing and I was convinced it was going to work. And then another thing, this is what we do as physicians, right? The moment they tell you, you can't try you can't innovate. You have to wait for your government to tell you what to write. You have to wait for the guidelines. You have to wait for this. You know, that's not, that's not okay. And, and, you know, I hope that there are doctors out there that are still, you know, I know in GI, we're very lucky. There's a lot of good doctors that are very righteous and I trust the guidelines. Okay. But not every field is the same. And, you know, a lot of fields are motivated by funding. And and I wonder if in pediatrics, that field has not been completely infiltrated by pharma to push, push, push these vaccines. And to the point that you've just branded these pediatricians to not even think and just say, okay, you need a vaccine. You know, a kid comes in after an ear infection Every time you vaccinate him, the kid comes in with an ear infection. You have to ask yourself, what what mm-hmm. happened that that kid is always coming in right after the vaccine a week later with an ear infection? Yeah. But the problem is that thought doesn't even come into the pediatrician's minds because they are believing they're doing something right with these vaccines, Okay. It's like antibiotics, okay? Remember antibiotics? We thought they were great. And they are. I mean, you know, they are. When you have a UTI, you need an antibiotic. When you have a pneumonia, you have an antibiotic. But what would, what did we learn? When you have a virus, it's not that great. And you shouldn't be giving antibiotics for every little thing. You know, so many patients with irritable bowel syndrome, the doctor thinks they have diverticular disease and they're given antibiotics. 
And it's not even, it's spasm of the colon. So, you know, we keep giving and then eventually we discovered, wait, we're overdoing it with antibiotics and it caused C. diff. And now we have to take poop to fix, you know, and we gave phalagyl and we gave vancomycin and it didn't work. But now we have to take poop and implant it. And now that works, right? So what are we doing with poop? We're giving a new garden, right? In a microbiome that was, what is happening in C. diff? You've killed the microbiome. You've given antibiotics after antibiotics. You're killing the microbiome. So what is going to happen? C. diff is going to flourish, secrete toxins to kill you because you are supposed to be the reservoir of microbes, good and bad microbes with a diverse microbiome. You kill that diversity. You kill your good microbes. Well, the bad bugs are just going to take over and put you back in the ground. That's the way it works. That's it. Maybe so, to ashes. I, I think you should. I think Best the way to us. fix this is you need to call the microbiome project the diversity, equity, and inclusion <laughs> of bacteria project. I love and it. And it'll blow up, and you'll have tons of funding, and we'll fix all this. But it, but it. But it, but it, it gets back it gets back to the fundamentals of challenging even right. fundamental ideas. Yes. Yes. So I think, and I think we talked I talked to you about this before, is we've come to we've hit maximum germ theory. So germ theory started in about what eighteen eighty five ish, yes. Yes. and and then you know you had Pasteur and and yes. List, Lister and all that, and and now we're at a point where germs are actually most germs like the vast majority are really good not really bad right and so you know we we need to change our I, thinking and, and again this is the balance right so yeah. you're overdoing it with the cleaning you're overdoing mm -hmm. it with, with the antibiotics you're overdoing it with the vaccines immunity is built it's about exposing yourself to the virus yes. right so how did i survive covid well i exposed myself to thousands of different strains. I'm analyzing stools from COVID, right? I'm exposed to patients. I'm traveling. I'm embracing people. I'm kissing people. You know what I mean? On their cheeks, obviously. On their cheeks. <laughs> but you know what I mean? It's basically that accumulation of microbes. It, I'm accumulating more and more microbes. That's immunity. immunity building your immune system. Building exactly. those microbes. Exposing yourself to it, getting sick, surviving. Have you ever noticed how when you have a cold, you're super sick for like 48 hours, but then after like about a week, you replenish your nutrition, you replenish your vitamins, you replenish your gut health. And then you're like, oh my God, I'm so much stronger than I was, right? Because what doesn't kill you, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And immunity is the accumulation of microbes. Dr. Feingold, who I inherited all his work, to continue his path and work on autism, lived till 97 years old. He played with microbes his whole life. He had a whole lab of just microbes and poop. Uh, you know, I have to say, maybe his longevity was probably the exposure of all these microbes. You know, you look at these farmers that are playing with poop and cow and, and cows and, and farming and putting their hands in the ground. You know, are they living longer? Are they, you know, you know, what are they doing? You know, I, I know, you know, some um, farmers uh, who are in their 90s and they have, um, you know, beautiful farm and, and they do everything by hand and they're they're still doing great. So, huh. yeah, there's lots. Of, it, the, the thing that's fun about it is, you know, then, then we <clears throat> then we talk to Anthony Chafee or Sean Baker and it's like, well, it's because they eat lots of meat. And I'm like, you know, maybe it's not the carnivore diet. It's it, the fact that they're actually, well, that's the point. Playing that's with why the you have to, and that's why soil. Sean, who I respect greatly says, well, I don't know what the answer is. Amazing. I know, yeah. I know <laughs> that there's certain things that seem yeah. to work, but that's why we need really good research. And yes. that's the point. Yes. And, and we have to question everything. May and I interviewed somebody, great guy, great ENT doctor. And I said to him, I said, we don't actually know in the totality of humanity, if antibiotics are a net positive or a net negative. Right now, they're a net positive. We've, we've taken pneumonia, which used to be the number one killer for essentially the entirety of humanity, and we've made it largely an outpatient treated disease. 
But we don't know if in 200 years from now, we'll have killed off so much of the microbiome that no mammals will be able to survive at all. We really don't right. know. And we need that humility to, to kind of scratch our heads and challenge these things. Or else we're not we're really- working on that. We're working on an immunity marker that when you do take antibiotics, we can tell whether you're if, where you're at so that you can kind of reboost yourself. You know what I mean? That mm -hmm. it's going to be like a blood test, but you know, that, that's at the end of the day, it's about that. It's about what lives in your gut. How do you build up your immunity? We're not there yet, but we will be, you know, I mean, look at where we were when we, when people were bleeding a hundred years <laughs> ago, 200 years ago, yeah. we didn't have hemoglobin to know what to transfuse them. We didn't know like, oh, you need to transfuse at a hemoglobin of seven and, and, and below. You know, all that came with courageous people that were pushing the agenda and saying, look, I think this hemoglobin is really the way to look at GI bleeders. And then other people said, well, let's look at who's bleeding and who needs blood transfusion and who doesn't. And then we didn't know that we could spread viruses through the blood you know how many people got hepatitis c right. you know how many people got hiv we didn't know all these things so it takes time to to advance science but if you stop science if you stop imagine if back then they stopped the hemoglobin and they said sorry you're not going to do a hemoglobin anymore we're going to just let people bleed or we're just going to transfuse them when we feel like we need to transfuse them we would have never advanced you know, so well, they actually, well, they what? threw, they, they threw, they threw that guy in, the they threw asylum. Ignat Simmelweis yes. in an insane asylum for yes. watching, washing his hands after autopsies before yes. he delivered babies. Right. Yes. So, <laughs> and then they beat him to death in the insane asylum. Like, yes, you can't, so, you can't make this up. So here we are no, again. So, so but we, we haven't seen is, much. No, but I mean, let's hope. They're not, putting us in an, they're not putting us in an insane asylum oh. because there are no insane asylums, you know? Right. Well, people they've shut the they've shut people up before, and they'll keep trying again. But the key is really to be able to let physicians question and challenge and pu put their information out there, at least well, to be yeah, heard and signed. Maybe someone might pick it up and develop something better, you know. But but if you can't even publish, if you're getting things retracted, to some well, uh, then 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 that doesn't even advance medicine. So. Thank you for speaking up and standing up. Unfortunately, we do we have a hard stop tonight, yes. so we do have to uh, we do have to wrap this up. But I, I want to say one thing, and, and this means so much to me. And you know, you have been so kind to us being on our show. Is is your example of I think three things that really matter: courage, humility, and curiosity. Yes, that's what changes the world. Courageous to look curious to ask the questions and humble enough to be wrong right there. If, if we had more doctors like that, we would change the whole freaking world. I, I hope that I'm a, I'm a, I'm a role model to more doctors. That's what I hope and pray for every day. You know, I hope that my courage to speak gives courage to other doctors. I don't want to be the voice alone. I want to be a voice that's echoing with other voices. So I hope that more doctors are courageous to treat, to try, to innovate, to think of their patients first before worrying about losing their license. If you do things right, God carries you through. And, you know, I'm still standing with a license and I'm still mm -hmm. okay. I have to believe that I'm doing something right. And you know, I'm going to keep doing it until one day I can't do it anymore. And then I'll hire someone else to do it. So, <laughs> exactly. you know, because yeah. I want to see the truth. And ultimately, the truth is for me first, right? I mean, if I, if I don't look carefully, um, then I'm cheating myself, right? Then I'm, I'm basically, it's going to affect me first. So the truth is for me. I mean, for for me, my family, you know, of course I'm going to be wrong. I don't know it all. And of course I have to be humble. Um, but I hope other doctors come to be, you know, doing the same and to speak up. And, and if they see something wrong with the system, to speak up. Speak up to your association. Speak up to other doctors. The more doctors come to this, the, the better we are at saving humanity, in my opinion. 
Absolutely. Amen. Thank you. And thank you for having me. And thank you for speaking, you guys. Oh, Absolutely. Welcome. Anytime. It's no secret that medicine is a bit um, uptight. That's why Tim and I created BS Free MD to mix things up a little and have fun in the process. Besides, we are having these exact same discussions all the time, so we thought we might as well invite everyone to the party. If you really like us, you can get plenty more and maybe see one of Tim's cool tattoos on our Instagram or Facebook pages at BS Free MD. See you next time. Well, we try to keep BS Free MD as raw and real as possible. We can't be held responsible for any medical decisions or discussions had as a result of what you've heard on the show. We know, bummer. But the truth is, we really do care about your questions. So feel free to reach out to us by email at doc at bsfreemd.com.